tonight, the school's stoush continues, with the Federal Education Minister backpedalling after a blistering attack on the Premier. This is a failure of leadership by Dan Andrews. Also tonight, a primary school in Melbourne's north closed for three days after a teacher tests positive to COVID-19. The virus runs out of control in Brazil, but the country's president says there's no problem. And the Victorian coastal communities experiencing growing pains. Hello and welcome to ABC News Sunday. I'm Tamara O'Dyne. A frustrated Federal Education Minister has been forced into an embarrassing backdown after attacking Premier Daniel Andrews' approach to schools. Dan Tian accused the Premier of a failure of leadership during the coronavirus pandemic, only to withdraw the comments hours later. His political editor, Andrew Proben. School's back for some. Have a good day. South Australia, Western Australia and the Northern Territory belled the resumption of classroom teaching last week. Other states and territories are to follow, but not Victoria. This is a failure of leadership by Dan Andrews. The Federal Education That's Minister fine. taking the cane to the Victorian Premier. Why are you taking a sledgehammer to your school system? We don't need the Federal Education Minister trying to bully and harass state education ministers. At issue is why Victoria is resisting the medical advice to the National Cabinet that schools present a low risk to students and can be fully open. We have one Premier in particular who is jeopardising the national consensus on this. The Premiers should listen to the medical experts. For a political hit, his timing was poor. Victorian authorities revealing a primary school would be undergoing a deep clean after a teacher overseeing vulnerable students was diagnosed with COVID-19. I'm sure that Dan Tien would have liked to have had that knowledge before making those remarks earlier today. Dan Tien's unusually fiery criticism of the Victorian Premier risks shattering the bipartisanship that served Australia well during this crisis. National Cabinet's unity has been its strength and allowed the Prime Minister to forge a world-leading response. But with that spirit threatened, the Federal Education Minister sought to clear up any suggestion he'd been acting on Scott Morrison's orders. Dan Tien issuing a statement saying personal frustration had led him to overstep the mark in questioning Premier Andrew's leadership. I withdraw, he said. Our advice has not changed. Despite the minister's backtracking, it's understood the Prime Minister does not resolve from his firm view that students should return to the classroom. And on that, he has some expert backing. Children should go back to school. We've got very low transmission in Australia, and it's probably as low as we're going to get. And we're going to have to live with this for the next 18 months to two years before an effective vaccine becomes available. We will take you from here. A long time for students, teachers and parents to get used to the new normal. Andrew Proben, ABC News, Canberra. The confirmed case of a Melbourne primary school teacher was one of 13 new cases of COVID-19 in Victoria over the past 24 hours. Parents and school contractors have been notified the school will be closed for three days for deep cleaning. And as Amelia Turzon reports, that has the Victorian government determined to stay the course on restrictions. The Meadow Glen Primary School in Epping had the cleaners in today. The school's music teacher tested positive on Friday, leaving its principals stunned. Absolute shock, mainly because this teacher didn't really have any symptoms. He just had a slight cough and he'd been working in the school with us. While most Victorian students are remote learning during the pandemic, schools are still open for vulnerable children and those whose parents are essential workers. Meadow Glen had up to 70 kids attend class this week, but its principal says she isn't worried. Luckily for us and for all our kids, he wasn't in contact with them. He did other work for us in terms of a lot of filming. Two other staff have gone into isolation. Alex's twin boys are enrolled at the school and he's thankful they were at home learning on laptops when the teacher got sick. Hopefully it hasn't spread to anyone else. It's not surprising. It seems it could pop up anywhere. 
While the Federal Education Minister was backtracking on his criticism of Premier Daniel Andrews, the state opposition was maintaining the pressure over schools. Every other state is either back to school or has a plan for getting back to school. Victoria is the holdout. The state government is standing firm and says it won't make any decision on reopening schools until May 11th. It comes as the state has recorded 13 new cases of the virus overnight. That's the biggest jump in cases in three weeks. I ask Victorians to show some patience. Um, it can seem like it's been an eternity since these restrictions have been put in place. I think it's important that we're 100% sure that it's the right time to go back. But it's not easy to take when you're cooped up at home. What do you miss about going to school? Seeing your friends. Oh. And how's it learning on the computer? Bad. Is Dad a good teacher? No. <laughs> a lesson for parents about the benefits of teachers. Amelia Turzon, ABC News, Melbourne. Brazil has emerged as Latin America's COVID-19 epicentre, with the ninth highest death toll in the world, overtaking both China and Iran. The deaths have escalated so quickly, parts of the country have run out of coffins. While much of the world is now starting to see a flattening of the curve, Brazil's is a complete contrast. The number of cases is rising sharply, with a startling 6,000 new cases in just one day this week. Despite all that, the Brazilian president is still telling residents the impact of the virus is exaggerated and that social distancing isn't really necessary. At this cemetery in Sao Paulo, burials are happening on an industrial scale. Mourners are allowed five minutes at the gravesite before the next funeral rolls in. From the air, a sobering sight of what may be to come. 13,000 fresh graves have been prepared and they're still digging. Across Brazil, cases of infection are rising fast. Hospitals are undermanned and overstretched. Many suspected COVID-19 deaths are not added to the official tally. They wrote here undetermined cause of death, but why don't they carry out an autopsy to verify it? Why hide this stuff? Brazil's poorest citizens live in tightly packed favelas. For many, stopping work means going hungry. How do you self-isolate when you have seven people across three generations living to a single room uh, no proper water sanitation, no proper running water. Rio de Janeiro-based journalist Lucinda Elliott says the city's infamous crime gangs have stepped up to encourage stay-at-home directives. You had gangs going around in cars with their speakers on, encouraging people to stay at home. Brazil's president has described COVID-19 as a little flu. He's joined protests against lockdown measures imposed by state governors and brushed off the mounting death toll. So what? I mourn the deaths. What do you want me to do? As protests against his handling of the crisis grow, the president has fired his health minister and sacked his federal police chief, prompting his justice minister to resign. But his voter base remains solid. There are clear parallels between the way the US president and his Brazilian counterpart have played this crisis. But even Donald Trump, who presides over the world's highest official death toll, is now pointing to Brazil as a nation having a very hard time. David Lipson, ABC News, Washington. And the US president has tweeted that he's glad to see North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is back and well. After weeks of speculation that he was sick or dead, Kim Jong-un was shown on state television opening a new fertiliser plant near Pyongyang. It was his first public appearance since the 11th of April. A large crowd wearing face masks cheered as he cut the ribbon for the project. The leader appeared in good health after reports he'd undergone a cardiovascular procedure. The federal government has ramped up its repatriation efforts from India after some Australians spent more than five weeks stuck there amid the country's lockdown. Flights left from four major cities last week. Our South Asia correspondent James Oten was on one of them. Reporting under India's lockdown has been an intriguing experience. But there was one caveat. If something went wrong, I was stuck. 
So it was decided I'd board the first official repatriation flight okay. back to Australia. And another empty airport. With commercial flights now at a halt once bustling airports are mostly empty. Just a few staff remain for security and health checks. And after it all, two weeks in quarantine. But it's certainly feeling a lot more real now. The Australian government has organised more than 30 repatriation flights across the world, but delays in securing flights from India prompted stranded Australians to book privately organised charters. I just don't think there was any politically political imperative to get this moving fast. The public's perspective toward citizens overseas was negative to outright hostile. It really does come down to uh, the government and then obviously to make it profitable uh, for the airline. Germany's first of many repatriation flights departed just days into India's lockdown. I think in case of Australia, I think the government just took a little bit longer, well, uh, a lot longer. The Australian government has now secured more flights from India, this time with Qantas. They'll come as a relief for many. The airport is quite empty. But frustrating for those who paid over $1,000 more for the initial flights. At least government should have told proper communication to people. They will ha could have saved a lot of money. The Department of Foreign Affairs says the situation in India remains complex, with Australians spread across 27 states. James Oten, ABC News. People in Spain have been allowed outside to exercise for the first time in seven weeks after one of the strictest lockdowns in Europe. They've been allocated time slots to take short walks and play sports. Special shifts have also been set aside for elderly and vulnerable people, while the beaches are attracting big crowds of swimmers and surfers. I think people are happy. I'm happy. We are tired, we're tired. We are not in shape, especially older people. But it was a nice day. Social distancing laws will be enforced and masks have been made compulsory on all public transport. And later this hour, Jeremy Fernandez takes a look at who's getting it right with the lifting of COVID-19 restrictions. We'll look at what other countries and regions are doing and what we might learn from their experience. I'll be back with the virus straight after the weather. One unexpected consequence of the COVID-19 crisis has been the dramatic drop in the price of oil. A trade dispute between Russia and Saudi Arabia, combined with the sharp drop in demand, has seen prices at the pump drop to levels not seen since the early 2000s. Across Melbourne, the average price of regular unleaded was just 89.8 cents. It's been a lot lower across Victoria. And in Melbourne today, you can fill up for under 80 cents a litre. To explain what's driven prices so low and to look at whether they'll stay there, here's Alan Kohler. Well, it's been a while since we've seen these sort of numbers at the Bowser. So how did this happen? And more importantly, how long is it going to last? Remember peak oil? Well, maybe not, but it was the theory first proposed by a bloke named M. King Hubbard in 1956 that oil production would peak in about the year 2000 and then inexorably decline, like this. And when the oil price went above 140 US dollars a barrel in June 2008, it seemed like Mr Hubbard was an oracle and that the price, as predicted, was on the up and the world was in trouble. But then came the GFC and the price fell 80% before gradually, painfully recovering as the producers led by Saudi Arabia throttled production and got back some control. Next problem, American fracking. Thanks to the technology that extracts oil from shale deep underground, the United States went from big importer to self-sufficient and then exporter. Down went the price again. Fast forward to April the 20th, 2020, this year. And that will forever go down as the day the oil price went negative for the first time in history. Minus $37 US a barrel, to be precise. That is, sellers were paying buyers to take it off their hands. A negative oil price? How could that happen? Well, for a start, the peak oil thing turned out to be wrong. Thanks largely to fracking, there's been a glut, not a shortage. And then the demand destruction from the coronavirus shutdowns has been much greater than what happened in the GFC. For example, US gasoline demand has halved from 10 million barrels a day to five. And as a result of that, storage tanks are full 
to the point where oil is having to be stored in dozens of tankers off the Californian coast. Saudi Arabia and the OPEC producers are desperately cutting production and the American producers are shutting rigs and, burdened by massive debts, are starting to file for bankruptcy. This graph shows just how bad it's getting. The number of rigs operating in the US has collapsed. So it's really bad for oil producers, but at least the planet's enjoying it. Air pollution and carbon emissions are also declining because, of course, there are fewer cars and trucks on the road and planes in the sky. So we might as well roll down the window and enjoy the fresh air while we can. Now to tonight's special report. And while some of the country has enjoyed significant rain this week, other parts are still gripped by drought. This is how dry Australia was in December last year. And this is what was happening in March. The green areas show above average soil moisture. You can see big parts of Queensland and South Australia are still missing out. Even for those getting rain, years of hard times mean farmers are carrying huge debts. National Rural and Regional Correspondent Dominic Schwartz reports. Green is finally back on the palette of this cattle and sheep property west of St George. But after seven years of drought, there are not many animals left to enjoy it. It's been really hard, I can tell you. But uh, you don't talk about those sort of things. We've just had to battle on and survive the best way we can. For John Beardmore, flooding rain in February brought promise, but there hasn't been meaningful rain since. It doesn't rain cash crops and cows. So, yeah, we still need to support our farmers because they're still, they're still struggling. Tash Johnston is the founder of Drought Angels. Normally we have quite a lot of volunteers, but obviously due to COVID-19 and they're all mainly 70 plus, we've had to send them home so we can keep them safe. The Chinchilla-based charity last year raised $11 million to help farmers across Australia, but donations have dived during the pandemic. About 50% at least. With fewer volunteers, Tash and her husband Steele are now making the deliveries. Today, they're headed to St George, 300 kilometres away. Recent rain has turned dust bowls into pasture, but it's going to take a lot more to turn farmers' fortunes around. People still have huge debts to actually um, to deal with, and if it doesn't get follow-up rain, they won't have any money coming into their bank accounts. It's really hard. First stop for the Drought Angels is a local charity. So what do you believe is your value in each box? Uh, about 100. Then they're off for a home visit. Welcome to Rose Hill. John and Elaine Beardmore expected their guests, but not the bounty. Groceries, toiletries and fresh fruit and vegetables. Everything. I had a lot of things given to us over the droughts and that, but nothing like this. So we've got some prepaid visas for you too. For people who pride themselves on feeding others, it's overwhelming. It's unreal. Thank you for that. Chinchilla farmers Greg and Leanne Evans know the feeling. They dared to hope the drought was breaking after solid rain in February, but with nothing since, their mung beans have languished. I don't know that we'll be able to feed Australia with, with what we've got here, that's for sure. Just to be able to know that drought angels um, can put some food on the table or it can get your kids some clothes, you know, clothes for school, has been very uplifting. If anything, coronavirus is definitely uh, let people know that how much we need our Australian farmers and what beautiful produce we've produced so it's incredibly important to support them now. Marmalade. Former North Melbourne player and coach Dean Laidley is in custody after being arrested last night. The 53-year-old was arrested in St Kilda and he appeared in the Melbourne Magistrates Court today. He's been remanded until the 11th of May. A population boom on the Bellarine Peninsula and Surf Coast is stoking tensions between property developers and locals. Now the state government is putting limits on future developments. Stephen Schubert reports. The Wallace family say they've found paradise. We moved here two years ago and the families we've met and the community feel has just been out of this world. The young family sold their small house in Reservoir in Melbourne's north to buy a larger home in a new housing estate in Ocean Grove. The kids are very active, very outside, 
based. We <laughs> we don't school holidays. We don't spend a lot of money anymore. You know, we go to the beach or we go to the parks or the river. Estates like this have been taking over what used to be farmland. Not everyone thinks they're a good idea. If there's future development again, then I think the character of the, of the town will change completely. It'll be too big. At the last state election, Labor proposed to fix the boundaries of towns on the Bellarine Peninsula and the Surf Coast. That would mean new houses could only be built within those boundaries and there'd be no more new housing estates. That would last for 50 years and could only be changed by an Act of Parliament. We have to strike a balance uh, between uh, protection of these areas uh, and obviously population uh, uh, as well. But there are concerns from those inside the property industry that restricting the supply of housing will price people out of the market. If there's a complete restriction on further development, then the prices will rocket. And we've already seen that happen in recent times. And the young, younger generation will not be able to afford to live here. Phil Edwards says there's already plenty of land that's been put aside for development within the town's existing boundaries. And once that's done, there should be no more. It won't be the place that it was. There's scope for 15 years of housing still available within the boundary. So we can't understand why developers want the opportunity to take yet more land for more development. <laughs> The Wallace family say they don't think it would be fair to not let other people share in the lifestyle they enjoy, as long as any development is well planned. It's incredible what it's done for us, really. Sarah's happy, kids are happy, uh, happy wife, happy life <laughs> is so true. A lifestyle many families want that could be endangered by too many people seeking it. Stephen Schubert, ABC News, Ocean Grove. One of the major concerns for health workers during the COVID-19 crisis has been the shortage of personal protective equipment. It's seen fashion and textiles students and teachers from RMIT team up with the CSIRO to create something they hope will be useful on the front lines. Iskander Razak reports. It may look old fashioned, but this is cutting edge for a world in crisis. This is what we call a rapid response project. <laughs> the sudden high demand for personal protective equipment and the global lockdown means Australia has a shortage. Traditionally, the masks that we've seen the medical practitioners wearing are made from a man-made material, uh, petrochemicals, uh, and they're all imported materials. But this non-woven wool blend is Australian made and is part of a federal government initiative the RMIT Fashion and Textile School was called in for a special project. We never thought at this time, like studying for three years, we'll end up, you know, sewing surgical masks as part of our fourth year. A prototype was designed and refined. And in two days, a mini production line, which included social distancing rules, made a hundred of the prototype masks. It's not all about material. Health professionals say the average surgical mask, even the more higher end stuff, it can be uncomfortable, even painful to wear over time. And many can't be molded to fit properly to people's faces. So we looked at the movement of the mouth and tried to design around that and allow the mask to expand and contract in a way that didn't break the seal. The RMIT team is also excited about what this might mean for local manufacturing. What's really nice about this is that we're using, um, you know, wool off the sheep's back. I know at the moment there's a lot of conversations about make Australia make again. This is the final prototype and it now goes through more strenuous trials to see if it actually works. But even if unsuccessful, it's an example of Australian ingenuity in adversity. Iskandar Razak, ABC News, Melbourne. Not many people have heard of Deal Island in Bass Strait and even fewer have been there. But for one couple, it's the place they've happily called home. Lucy McDonald reports. Rachel and Daniel Weeks are living what they consider to be an ideal isolation. We've got everything we could ever want. Uh, we're on a national park that's six and a half k's long and four and a half k's wide with their own beaches and walking trails. The couple has spent the past two months on Deal Island as volunteer caretakers. It's a far-flung island in the middle of Bass Strait that's accessible only by sea. But the timing is purely coincidental. We've been thinking about it for three or four years and really planning for it for four months, so we were mentally very prepared for it. So, yeah, it's pretty ironic that the whole world's followed suit. 
As part of the three-month stint, the couple must maintain and repair the island's walking tracks and historic buildings, including the Southern Hemisphere's highest lighthouse. We've got responsibility, so we don't have much time to sit around feeling sorry. It's just out and about, getting on with it, enjoying it. Whilst the island receives few visitors, it's a favourite spot for kayakers and yachties. But coronavirus restrictions means those visits have stopped. We've now found ourselves totally alone, which is... Yeah, it's actually quite an amazing feeling. It's a different feeling, um, but something that we're really embracing now. It's safe to say the weeks are feeling pretty lucky. We do pinch ourselves. I don't think we could be in a better place um, to be riding this isolation out. Before long, they'll be back to their full-time jobs in Adelaide. So for now, they're making the most of every minute in lockdown. Lucy MacDonald, ABC News. The Melbourne storm is awaiting approval from the New South Wales government to train in Albury after the Victorian government rejected its return to training this week. The NRL says it's on track to resume competition later this month, with the New Zealand Warriors arriving at Tamworth Airport tonight. The country music capital became the centre of the rugby league world when the New Zealand Warriors touched down in Tamworth. Star winger David Fusatua didn't travel for compassionate reasons, while hooker Nathaniel Roach wasn't feeling well and was told to stay home. He didn't and hasn't had any di uh, direct um, contact with any player or staff member that's flying to Australia now. The ARL Commission chairman says the Warriors' arrival shows the bold bid to restart the competition is on track. The fact that we've got both the federal and state government approvals for the, for the Warriors, I'm very confident that we'll be able to start on the 28th of May. The Warriors will be in Tamworth under strict isolation conditions for a fortnight before relocating to the central coast. While they were granted an exemption, there was no such success for the Melbourne Storm, who had asked to train at their home base. They're now hoping to set up camp across the border in New South Wales. They sought an exemption. That exemption uh, was not granted. Uh, you know, no one is going to be getting special treatment. Peter Volandis says COVID-19 won't be a problem for the players. It's one in 10,000 chance um, to catch the virus if they abide by our biosecurity measures. The risk to the community is zero. Social distancing breaches from players during the week could be a blessing in disguise, according to former NRL coach Matthew Elliott. Now we've seen some poor decisions leading into this. Hopefully everyone is now super aware of what the expectations are from the, the leadership of the game, but also the entire community. Each NRL club will have a briefing tomorrow when players will be told what their obligations will be under the biosecurity measures. Training resumes on Tuesday ahead of the scheduled competition restart later this month. Duncan Huntstyle, ABC News. To the weather now, and there's been a glimpse of the ski season ahead in Victoria's Alpine region, if restrictions are lifted, that is. More than 60 centimetres of snow has blanketed Falls Creek over the past few days. The official start to the ski season is five weeks away. So snow on the Alps and showers pretty much everywhere else last night. Mount Borbore was wettest with 42 millimetres. Isolated showers continued over the south today, but there were some sunny breaks over the north and temperatures were a few degrees below average. Walpiup was the warmest place with a top of 17. In Melbourne it only got to 15 at around 12.30 this afternoon and outside now it's 13. Interstate it was overcast in Adelaide, sunny in Brisbane and Sydney, mostly sunny in Perth. The satellite image is showing low cloud across much of Victoria, Tasmania and South Australia and storm activity over northern Queensland and the top end. A large high pressure system will slowly cross Victoria tomorrow and Tuesday, then a cold front will move in from the bight later in the week. Showers and storms are expected in WA and the Territory tomorrow and there'll be showers in Tasmania's southwest. For the capital cities, sunny in Sydney, mostly sunny in Brisbane and Darwin. It'll be overcast in Adelaide and Hobart and showers and a less storm are likely in Perth. Back home, generally cool day tomorrow, dry and partly cloudy in the north and mostly cloudy over the south with isolated showers mainly in the morning. Morning fog will settle over inland regions and there'll be patchy early frost in the northeast. On the bays, 15 knot westerlies will tend south to southwesterly and then ease in the middle of the day, becoming variable waves to a metre. There's strong winds forecast for tomorrow along the East Gippsland coast. Monday in Melbourne will be cloudy with the chance of light showers in the west and east and a top of 15 down to 10 tonight.
And looking at the week ahead, it's going to warm up a little. Tuesday, mostly sunny and 18. Wednesday, partly cloudy, 19. Thursday is the pick of the bunch, partly cloudy with a top of 21. Friday, showers and 18. And that's it for this evening's bulletin. I hope you'll join me again tomorrow night from 7 o'clock. Until then, good night.